Good evening. Come have a seat. Find a seat. Get next to somebody warm. That's the best thing you can do. Good. Good. Welcome to VBS College of Jewish Studies. Um, tonight we're going to have a respite, a retreat, a haven from the politics of the day. Tonight we're going to deal with music. We're going to touch your soul. It's going to be a wonderful night. But let me tell you what's coming up so that everybody knows, and then we'll begin our program together. Um, next week, we return to the world of politics, and our guest is going to be the new Council General of the State of Israel here in Los Angeles, uh, Sam Grunswick. Um, the, the, the Council General's office is typically a Foreign Service officer, except there are three positions in North America, uh, New York, Chicago, and LA, which are directly appointed by the Prime Minister. And, uh, the new Council General here in LA is not a Foreign Service Officer of the State of Israel. He's a friend of the Prime Minister, and he's coming as his personal representative um, to Los Angeles. So we're going to have a chance to hear him and to interrogate him and speak to him and ask him some questions and explore his politics and his vision of the world. Um, you're all invited. It's next week, 7 o'clock as usual. And then the week after that, that would be the 8th, right? The week after that's the 15th. And our guest will be Professor Miriam Glazer of the American Jewish University, who's going to speak to us about the development of Israeli literature since 1967. We're going to open up some of the important texts, the poets, the poets and the writers, including Yehuda Amichai, of course, and Amos Oz, and some other writers that you might not have read because they're not translated widely, um, to explore the inner life of Israeli character through its literature. That'll be on the, tw on the 15th. And the closing session on the 22nd um, is going to be uh, about tomorrow's Zionism. And we're going to meet uh, Dr. Sivan Zakai, who's one of the leading Israel educators in North America. As well, we're going to invite uh, Rabbi Aaron Lerner, who's the director of Hillel at UCLA, and several of the student leaders at UCLA uh, to talk to us about is Israel and its position on campus and how young Jews are thinking about Israel. And that'll be the close of our session on February 22nd. I hope you'll make plans to come. As well, of course, every Shabbos morning, uh, we do Torah study. This coming Shabbat, this coming Shabbat, we're going to be having some guests here. There is a wonderful program. It started in Sweden with the uh, support of the Swedish government, and it's now spread all over Europe. It's called Paidea, which means learning. And it's a Jewish study, an advanced adult Jewish studies program uh, going on in Europe. And the, uh, one of the professors who teaches in the program, as well as the international director, Barbara Spector, is going to be here. And they're going to talk to us about um, life for European Jews. What is Jewish life in Europe like today? Now, you've all read about stuff, but we're going to have people from France and from Sweden and from Germany uh, with us to talk to us about their experiences. Most of these are teachers, academics, and community leaders. And they're coming to represent this institution and to speak to us about that experience. So that's this coming Shabbat. Torah study at 9 o'clock, services right after that. Then we'll have lunch. I hope it's enchiladas. And then after that, conversation about Europe's Jews uh, right after shul. Um, this, this month, the Friday nights are a little bit different because the next Friday, this coming Friday night is a quiet one, except if you're three. If you're three, come to shul, you'll love it. Um, if you're older than three, if you like three-year-olds, come to shul. Um, <laughs> On the 10th, which is next Shabbat, we would normally have Rimonim, but we're not. Instead, it's going to be a late Friday night service at 8 o'clock in celebration of Shabbat Shira. We're celebrating the music of Dr. Michael Isaacson. Um, Michael has been a member of our community for many, 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 many years. You know him because he's a very large, angry, a very large, loud man, um, and happens to, be, happens to be the leading composer of Jewish music in the world. Um, brilliant music. And he is retiring. Uh, and so in celebration of his retirement, he wrote a Friday night service, which is being performed in 25 synagogues uh, around the community and across the country, all on the same night. And we're going to be doing it here, or at least parts of it here. So that's on Friday night the 10th. It starts at 8 o'clock. New, interesting Jewish music. Um, Fascinating stuff, really very, very thoughtful music. And Cantor Barron, who's a friend of Dr. Isaacson, is going to sort of explain it to us and then in, allow us to enjoy it. And then the following week, we'll have Rimoni, which is the, 
17th. That'll be the 17th, okay? Um, that's a lot of announcements. And my wife is coming, so her neshama minion is meeting on February the 11th, which happens to be her birthday. So if you see Nina, she's this gorgeous girl with red hair. <laughs> tell her, happy birthday, I'm coming to your minion. Even if you're not, tell her that anyway. Because you'll make my life, my married life, a lot easier, okay? Um, it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a confusing, tough time. I, I'm not making political comments. I'm talking about the Super Bowl. It's a confusing, <laughs> tough time. You know, are you pro-Trump? Are you anti-Trump? Who cares? Atlanta Falcons, New England Patriots. Serious ideological confrontation. But here at Valley Best Shalom, we welcome everybody. So whether you're for Atlanta or whether you're for New England, stand up. Turn to the people next to you, everyone stand up and say, I'm glad you're here. Just turn around and say, I'm glad you're here. All right, don't sit down yet, because you're going to be sitting a long time. Put your arms around each other. Put your arms around each other. Put, we're going to do music tonight. You've got to get warmed up. Ready? We say a bracha for the chance to learn together and to grow together. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kiddishanu mitzvotav et sivanu, la'asok b'divrei Torah. Yaseh shalom, yaseh shalom. Shalom Aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom. Shalom Aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom. Shalom Aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom. Shalom Aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael. Yase shalom, yase shalom. Shalom Aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael. Please be seated, please be seated. On Yom Ha'atzma'ut, on Israel Independence Day, if you're in Israel, which I recommend you are one day, you turn on the radio or the TV, and they always broadcast the same program. In fact, the program is so well known that they broadcast it that the musical group Pugi once made a fun of it. It's an interview with a Chalutz. A Chalutz is one of the pioneers who built this state. And they say, good afternoon, Mar Shlutsky. Where did you come from? And he said, I came from Shlogeria. <laughs> and when did you come to Israel? Long time ago. And what did you find when you got here? Nothing. There was nothing. And they said, well, what did you have? He said, we only had, and this is, this is, this is the truth, that we only had two things that we found here in Israel, right? What did you find? He said, boats, mud, vishirim, songs. And that's what sustained the generations of those who built the state of Israel. And that's not that's not funny. That's actually really true. There were two things that sustained those generations. There was an endless task of rebuilding a land and rebuilding a people. And there were songs to give them strength. Now, in the beginning, the songs of Israel were smuggled from Europe. They were all Romanian folk songs put to Hebrew words. Right? Hava, Nagila, Hava, Nagila. Not many Hebrew words. That's only like three Hebrew words, which literally means, by the way, let's be happy. That's all it is. That's the whole song. Harry Belafonte does it better than me, right? <laughs> and then you got more Zionist song, like tzenda, 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 which literally means come out, come out, and look at the soldiers, you young girls. Um, th th these were these were European, Eastern European folk songs, which were taken to Israel or. Eastern European folk modes, which were brought from Europe and brought to Israel, and they put Zionist lyrics to them. Because that's what Zionism it was in the beginning. It was an expression of European nationalism. 
But then something remarkable happened. It crashed into the reality of Israel. And you brought together Jews from Morocco and Jews from Iraq, Jews from Yemen, Jews from Turkey, Arabs who lived next door. And in the beginning, Arabs and Jews mingled rather freely. And all of this music got cooked together. All of this music got cooked together. And out of that came a unique and beautiful idiom called Israeli music. It has Middle Eastern tones. It has North African tones. It has Asia Minor tones. It has European tones. Now it even has a little bit of American in it. And it's a remarkable mishmash, a remarkable stew, a goulash, of, or a falafel, of, of all of these different musical modes. And it really is endemic to Israel. It's really in, in indigenous. It is a, an indigenous musical form. It doesn't belong anymore to the Eastern Europeans or to the North Africans or to the people from Asia Minor. It has become its own thing. Tonight, we're going to explore Israeli music and where it comes from and what it looks like. And tonight, we have a wonderful guide to do this. You know, I'm an old guy, and I've been teaching for a very long time. And it's very, very, very rare that I meet a teacher who's better than me, and I say, oh, wow. Sit me in the back of the room. I just want to watch. Yuval Ran is not only a brilliant musician, Grammy Award winner, Academy Award winner, concert musician all over the world, but he's a wonderful teacher. He's one of those very few teachers that me, I'll sit in the back of the room and just say, you go, boy. I'm just going to watch. Yuval Ran has brought his orchestra tonight. He's going to introduce them to introduce all of us to the wonderful world of Jewish music. Please meet my good teacher, Yuval Ran. Thank you, Rabbi Feinstein. Thank you. I feel so good to be back here. This is, I feel at home when I see the faces of the friends, the people that I know. And when I meet Rabbi Feinstein and Kent or Phil, I just instantly feel at home. I really feel it. And I'm very happy uh, the Rabbi called me and asked me to give you this presentation tonight. So... Several years ago, UCLA contacted me, and they asked me to do six s lectures, a series of six lectures about the music of Israel. It was a land historic landmark. UCLA never done a seminar about Israeli music, and they did it with us about four years ago. There were six lectures about Israeli music. But tonight, I have to squish it all into one lecture. And it's impossible even to do it in six lectures or ten lectures because the music of Israel is so varied because the Jews came to Israel from all over the world and incredible mixes and styles have evolved in very short time. And we are talking from 1967 until today. So I chose some of the great, most important songs or songwriters to introduce you to this story. But to think about the music of Israel really is to think about East meets West. You know, when I grew up in Israel, I was fortunate to grow up hearing electric guitar like uh, Jimi Hendrix, The Doors, uh, Beatles, uh, blues. Uh, when I grew up, I heard classical music, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart. Uh, I grew up to hear Hasidic music. Uh, I heard uh, jazz, and I heard Arabic music. There was Arabic stations in the radio. In between the Hebrew station, you would go into Arabic stations. And on television, there were concerts of Arabic music on the Israeli television. At those times, there was the Jerusalem Orchestra of Arab Music. It no longer exists, but it was under the Israeli television uh, organization. There was a, a, a orchestra of Jewish and Muslim and Christian uh, playing together Arabic music, and they had a concert every Saturday night. It was on television. Their uh, conductor was called Zuzu Musa, and he was the, the orchestra of Zuzu Musa under the Israeli TV. And so growing up in this place that is in between the East and the West, you could grow up hearing all those styles of music. So... I would like to start tonight with the first lady of Israeli music. Take a guess. Who is the first lady? 
No, the first lady of... She's a songwriter. Naomi Shemer, yeah. The chairman of the Jewish Music Commission, Mr. Brown, he knows. Naomi Shemer. Now, Naomi Shemer was born in a kibbutz on the Kinneret, on the lake in the Galilee. She grew up in the kibbutz. And she came from a family of Russian Jews. So she grew up singing all those songs that the rabbi talked about. They used to sing, they call it Shira Betzibur, sing-alongs. Every night, people would sit around the fire and sing along. That's what Nomi Shemer grew up on. And also she knew classical music. She knew Russian music. And she went on to serve in the military army in the entertainment troops. And after that, she went to Jerusalem and studied in the academy in Jerusalem. And then she started composing all this beautiful music. Some of the most beautiful songs came from her pen. And she wrote lyrics. She wrote beautiful poetry, and she wrote the music, and she sang, and all the famous singers in Israel recorded her music at the beginning. And she wrote one special song. Out of all the songs that she wrote, the signature song is a love song to Jerusalem. She, s she wrote a love song to the city, and she wrote it before the Six Days War. Everybody think that she wrote it after Israel unified Jerusalem. She wrote it a few months before the 6 7 war, when the city was still separated. And she was still writing the song when Israel unified the city. And so she added two verses at the end. They were added after the war, saying, We came back to the city with our shofar, and we are blowing the shofar in. Uh, Harabite, near the, the Wailing Wall. This was added after the war. It was not originally in the song. And this song became so popular in Israel that some people said that Israel should replace the national anthem, Atikva, with that song. There was never a song before, never ever a song that people dared to say, let's change our national anthem Let's take this song instead. And there was a debate. Some people really wanted to do that, but they didn't. But it became a hymn of Israel, a hymn of Jerusalem. And this is our version of Yerushalayim Shel Zahav.
חזרנו אל בורות המים, לשוק ולכיכר. שופר קורא בהר הבית, בעיר העתיקה. ובמראות אשר בסלע, אלפי שמשות זוכות. נשוב ונרד אל ים המלח בדרך יריחו. ירושלים של זהב ושל נחושת ושל Elinor Citrish on vocals. So as you can hear, it's, it's, a, it's a very beautiful lyrical song. And you can hear in it all those relationships to Russian lyrical folk songs. You can hear relation to classical music, to Western classical music. You can hear an original, an original voice. This song is not like any other song that I know in any cultures. It relates to Western culture. It relates to East European culture. It relates to Western cu European culture. But it's not quite like anything else. It's not like Hava Nagila. And it's not like Hasidic songs. Nomi Shemer managed to create a special kind of Israeli music that comes influenced by Western East European culture. That's the culture that her parents came from. That's the culture she heard in the kibbutz. And out of that came a new style. And then, this was in 1967. And very short time after that came a very, very important songwriter, an Israeli songwriter named Shalom Chanoch. And Shalom Chanoch revolutionized Israeli music. He recorded the first Israeli rock music, the first Israeli rock album. It was called Sof Onat Atapuzim, the, the end of the uh, oranges season. <laughs> that was the name. And he was influenced by the Beatles. It was the end of the 60s, early 70s. He heard Beatles. He was influenced by the Moody Blues, by Pink Floyd, by all the, the Beach Boys, all the American and English rock music. And he grew up in a kibbutz, just like Naomi Shemer. So he knew all those Israeli folk songs that had Russian and Romanian and East European influences. He also studied classical music. And he mixed elements from classical music and rock. And he brought the electric guitars. And he brought a, a whole other kind of lyrics writings. So while Nomi Shemer wrote beautiful poetry, his lyrics, remember this is the, the, the late 60s. Completely different generation, different lyrics, different kind of writing, and different kind of tone of voice. And this was a revolution. It changed the sound and the style of Israeli music forever. And he's considered the, the king of rock of Israel. The king of rock. He's the one who started it. And he wrote all the music for Arik Einstein. In the first, the first several albums of Arik Einstein, who was one of the most famous Israeli singers, 
The music was written by Shalom Chanoch. So I'd like to play for you one of the songs. It's a very complicated song. It has different parts. It's like an epic song, and it can give you a sense for the complexity of this writer. And the words are very simple, very direct. The, the lyrics of Naomi Shemer is very flowery. It's very poetic. It's beautiful poetry. But the rock and roll generation, their lyrics were completely different. So he says, Why should I take it to my heart? I have new things in my head. I have new, new ideas. You know, this is the young generation breaking the rules. He says, I have an imagination that helps me sometimes to forget. And he says, I have lots of things to love, and I have always friends that help me to be happy. And then the chorus, he sings to the listener and says, let yourself laugh, let yourself learn, let yourself hear, let yourself live, let yourself be wrong, let yourself make errors, let yourself forgive and simply love. And this was really, uh, in the first period, this was all about sex, rock, and rock and roll. There was the drugs, there were the girls, there was the, uh, all the bohemian characters around these musicians, and out of this came this music. Uh, the last line, he says, what I really wanted to write, what I really wanted to say, is go with it slowly. Take it slowly. Take it easy. Take it easy. And then later you could go fast. But first take it easy. So it's a whole, it's a rebellious generation. They rebel against their parents. They rebel against the rules. And you can hear it in the music. The very beginning of the song, there's a, a very classical, like, Johann Sebastian Bach figure in the piano. And we're going to have the piano of the Middle East play it. Virginie will play it on the kanun. Could you show them the kanun, please? This is the kanun. It's the harp or the piano of the Middle East. And so um, the first line that you're going to hear will be played by that instrument. Notice, notice the, the, the different sections of the music. Notice the, the curves of the singing lines, how the voice jumps, go up and down. Always trying to break the rules. Z 
זה מה שרציתי לכתוב. לך עם זה לאט, ואז תוכל פשוט לרוץ מההתחלה. This is Virginie Alumian on Kanun. So if somebody asks you, what is Israeli music? Right now, you just heard two different songs, and it's so confusing. What is Israeli music? Those two songs sound completely different, isn't it? And they came both from kibbutz members who grew up in Israel on the old kibbutz songs. Different takes, different influences. In 1967, Israel established a tradition of Pastivalei Hazemer. What? Question? The words? Uh, I read, the, I, I translated the lyrics before we sang the song. Were you here? I, 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 can, I can translate to you after, okay? I translated the whole thing, word by word, just before we played it. <clears throat> but it's, it's um, I can't summarize it in one word, you know, but it's, it's, it's thoughts of, of a young man with rebellious new ideas. That's basically the meaning. Um, in 1967, Israel established a tradition of Pastivale HaZemer. Pastival, festival, Zemer is singing. And they had a Hasidic music festival. And they had, then later, they had also Mizrahi uh, festival. But they started with Hasidic festival. Once a year, people could write new music, new music 
in Hasidic style and send it to the committee and the committee would choose and then the 10 best songs would be performed live and the whole country would watch the television and everybody would be waiting to see who gonna win the festival and and then the committee, the judges, in live TV, and it was a black and white television, 1967, 1968, there was only one Israeli television channel, all black and white, only five hours a day, and everybody were glued to the TV, watching the festival of Hasidic music. And every year there was a different winner, and it, it was such a great um, boost to the career of whoever won that competition that legit writers in Israel who are completely secular, who were not going to synagogue, and they were not interested in Hasidic music, they wrote songs to get into the Hasidic festival because it was so, such a privilege and honor. And it was boosting the career of whoever won. So great rock singers like Tzvika Pik wrote a song Shema Yisrael. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Now, all synagogues in America are singing that as part of the service. This song was written by a rock star, an Israeli rock star that wanted to get in to the Hasidic festival. And the Hasidic festival became more and more popular, and people from America would go to Israel to be part of the festival. Rabbi Shlomo Karlibach. When I was a kid, I turned on the TV and I saw this rabbi with a guitar. I never seen a rabbi with a guitar in my life. <laughs> and, and, he, and he had the pelt. He was really an Orthodox rabbi, jumping with a guitar. I, and, he, and he had this American accent, really heavy American accent when he talked. I thought he was a very strange rabbi. <laughs> I didn't know if he's an actor who plays a rabbi or he's a rabbi. Just later I learned, when I grew up, I learned that he was a very important rabbi, a great man. He was a mystical rabbi. He was a great man, Karlibach. But when he came to Israel, it was, it was strange. And he had a choir of children. He brought children from America, little children, who would all had peot. <laughs> and, and they all had an American accent. And they would sing in the background with him. And they would go to perform in the Hasidic festival. And great writers like Nurit Hirsch wrote a song for that festival called Ose Shalom. The Re Rabbi Feinstein just sang it here. Ya se shalom, ya se shalom, shalom aleinu. This was one of the best songwriters for the pop Israeli scene. Somebody like Nomi Shemer, but her name was Nurit Hirsch. She wrote that song, Ose Shalom, to get into the Hasidic festival. And it became a huge hit in Israel. So those songs, they not just became part of Jewish tradition in America and in, in all over the world, they sing those songs. In Israeli schools, all the children in kindergarten, ele elementary school to middle school, would learn those songs. And these songs became Israeli music, Jewish Israeli music, and they all had Hasidic East European influence. Nothing of the East. It was all about the West. So here is one of the winners. Let's see if you know this song. One of the winners of that festival. I think there's not many Jewish weddings that the band doesn't know <laughs> to play that song.
This is Norik Manukian on clarinet. Give him a hand. And so all of the radio stations in Israel play this kind of music and the music that we played before and the music that we played before. This is all considered Ashkenazi music. None of what you heard has Arabic Middle Eastern modes. None of it has Arabic or Middle Eastern rhythms. It doesn't have anything Yemenite. It has anything, nothing Moroccan or Iraqi or Lebanese or Persian. This is all Western influence Israeli music. And that is all you could hear on Israeli radio and television. Except for one half an hour on Saturday where they let the Arabic orchestra play for half an hour. If you go to a record store, you could only find in the late 60s and early 70s this kind of music. This was the music of Israel, period. If you would come to Israel at that time and listen to the radio and television, you would think that all the people in Israel are all Ashkenazi. What happened to all the Jews that came from the Middle Eastern countries? They were shoved under the rug. The Israeli radio will not play anything of their culture. Because Israel was created by people from Poland, Germany, Russia, America, and the West. All Western Jews. And they couldn't hear, they couldn't tolerate anything Middle Eastern. They couldn't, they hated it. They considered it low culture. So it was not allowed to hear on the radio. And a whole culture was shoved down. People who were great musicians in Iraq, Jewish musicians that came from Baghdad, they came to Israel, they couldn't find any job as musicians. They had to change professions. A whole number of cultures lost their heritage. It was only played in weddings, in private parties, and they would record the music on cassettes, and they had kind of illegal, under-the-table uh, stands in the clothing market in, the, in a not, not very nice street in Israel near the bus stations where you would go to buy those cassettes. Where you, you know, next to the, the vegetable stand and the clothing stand in a street market. That's the only place you could buy the music of the Jews of the Middle East. And then in 1976, a director from America named Nola Shelton made Aliyah to Israel. Great theater director, Nola Chilton, and she made her theater all about social justice. All she cared about is to bring social justice, justice issues into the theater. And she had a method where she would go to slums of Jews from Morocco, slums of Jews from Iraq, and she would record them, she would interview them, and she would write plays based on the interviews, using real characters, real stories. And she started to have success. And the Haifa Theater, a big theater, hired her to do a play about the Jews of Morocco living in slums in Israel. And she needed music. And she went to that slum where, where the Moroccan Jews were living, near Haifa, and she found a guy working in, she asked people, where can I find musicians? They said, oh, there's a guy, Shlomo, he's a Uved Babinyan, he's working in construction. There's a construction worker. He, he has a band, you know, they play some, some of our music. She went to the construction site, you know, and pulled out this, this construction worker, Jew from Morocco, and his name is Shlomo Bar. And she asked him, could you play for me your music? And she came to his house. He had a, a violinist from India, a guitarist from uh, Latin America, uh, he had a uh, Bukhari Jewish bass player, and he played the drum and sang. And they had songs. And she said, could you come and write music for my play? And he said, sure, I'll write the music for your play. And he wrote the songs for the play, and his band were on the stage 
in one of the most important theaters in Israel, the, the, the regional theater of Haifa, the third biggest city of Israel. It was a, a, a very, very, very good director was hired and the top-notch actors, and it was all about this culture of the Moroccan Jews with their music. And it was on the stage of the theater. And suddenly, this was an incredible revolution. Because of that play, they had to play the music on the radio. This was the first Mizrahi group that their music was played on the Israeli radio. 1976, they opened the door. That was the revolution. And their, their group is called Habrera Ativit. Habrera Ativit, the natural choice. The name of the band is The Natural Choice. And they felt that their natural choice is to create music of the East. Because we are in Israel, and Israel is in the East, and people from all over came, but it has to be, the natural choice for them is to do music that is based on Eastern, Middle Eastern, scales and st rhythms and this is one of the songs that they wrote and the funny thing about this song it's called Yeladim Ze Simcha Yeladim Ze Simcha children are happiness children is happiness and they ask him to write a funny song for the play about why why the Moroccan Jews have so many children that's what the director asked him. You know, look, look at all, all the Ashkenazi families here in Israel. They have two kids, maybe three kids. Why are you, the Moroccan Jews, you have seven, eight kids? Ex explain that in the song for the play. So he wrote that song that says, well, you can have one child, you can have second, second, you can have, but if you have third, you get, you get an extra uh, deduction from the government. And if you have fourth kids, you get extra payment from the government. If you have seven, eight, nine kids, you get more honor from your neighbors, you get more help from the government, and it's good. And children are happiness. Children bring happiness. And he talks about, uh, he said, God, God is great, because God gives one power, koach. To the other, God gives kesef money. And to you, God gives children. <laughs> so this is the song. And, and the, the last word of each course, that it says, Yeladim ze simcha, Yeladim ze simcha. Children are happiness, children are happiness. At the last line of the course, it says, you don't believe me? Go and ask the rabbi. <laughs> so Rabbi Feinstein is mentioned in that historic song, Lechu tishalu et arav. Go and ask the rabbi. He will tell you. So the more the children, the merrier. Now, you, you will recognize and appreciate that the rhythm of this song is completely different than anything that what we hear. The rhythm is 6-8 Moroccan. Okay, it's Moroccan rhythm. Jimmy, could you give us a, a sense of what 6-8 Moroccan is? And the way the clap, so if we go... So the way they clap is one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Now, if you clap, if you find yourself clapping like a waltz, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, give yourself one bad point. <laughs> <laughs> so one, two, one, two. Tak takatum, tak takatum, tak takatum. That's it.
שניים, תביאו שלושה, תביאו ארבעה ילדים. תקבלו שיכונים עם כניסה ומטבח ושני חדרים קטנים. תביאו ארבעה, תביאו חמישה, תביאו שישה ילדים. תקבלו הנאה וכבוד מקרובים, אתם אוהבים ילדים. ילדים זה שמחה, ילדים זה ברכה. שלם של זהב, כתוב בתורה, אולי בגמרא, לכו תשאלו את הרע. תביאו שישה, תביאו שבעה, תביאו שמונה ילדים. זאת לא בדיחה, הארץ צריכה הרבה צעירים נחמדים. תביאו תרסר ולמה לא חי, תביאו עשרים ילדים. אלוהים כבר ייתן מסעד גם כן, מה שצריכים ילדים. אלוהים הוא גדול, קשה לא לסבול, שאחד יקבל את הכל, לאחד הוא נותן. כסף, כוח וכיף, ולכם הוא נותן ילדים, This is Jamie Papish and David Martinelli on percussion. So this revolution of the Mizrahi music coming into becoming legit changed slowly the official window of Israeli music. It starts to slowly balance out and not be so East European heavy as it was in the first uh, few decades of Israel. And now, because they had a stage, they could reach larger audience. They, they also had now the festival, the Mizrahi music festival, just like the Hasidic. The Hasidic was the East European festival. And they had the Mizrahi festival on the same stage with the same honors. And people start to write more and more Mizrahi music, original Mizrahi music. And one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Mizrahi songwriter of Israel, his name is Aviu Medina. And he's from a Yemenite family, mix. His father came from Yemen, his mother from Sephardic uh, Yerushalmi family from Jerusalem, Sephardic people who came hundreds of years ago to Jerusalem. That's from his mother's side. And he grew up in that Israel where music was not something that you could do for a living. So he did music for himself, and he had to make a living. So he established a business of uh, diamonds, of polishing diamonds. And he did well with that. And then 
suddenly the revolution of this song that we just did opened the door for him to start writing music professionally. And he started writing music for the festivals. Uh, he wrote music for many of the greatest Mizrahi singers of Israel. And he wrote the one song, the signature song that he wrote, that is the only song in the history of Israel, beside of Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, that some people said that, ah, this is the national anthem of Israel. This is the most popular song in many of the Sephardic synagogues in the world. Uh, it's one of the most popular songs in Israel among the Mizrahi Jews. And it, it has elements from Sephardic Jerusalem style. The music, the modes is of the East. But he creates something special with that. It has Spanish flavor. It has Arabic flavor. It has all the flavors that you can hear around Jerusalem. And it has also the Jewish cantorial, the Jewish prayer, Sephardic Jewish prayer and Yemenite Jewish prayer also woven into this song. This song is also about Jerusalem, just like Yerushalayim Shel Zahav. And this song is called Shabachi Yerushalayim. Thank you. 
Give a hand to Elino, Elino Citrish. So Avinu, Avinu Medina and a couple of other composers start writing all these beautiful songs. But this was not the case for hundreds of years with these Jewish communities in Arabic and Muslim world. For some reason, Jews didn't compose much original music in those countries. In Iran, in Egypt, in Syria, in Baghdad, there were few, few Jewish composers. There were lots of Jewish musicians, lots of mu Jewish writers, lots of Jewish poets and cantors and rabbis. But it was the custom in those, those countries among the Jews in all the Middle East, is to pick up existing tunes from their neighborhood, from their neighbors, from the Muslim community, religious songs and folkloric songs, and to switch the words to Hebrew liturgical words. And this is called piyutim. We call it piyutim, which means a liturgical poetry song. And they would become really expert in writing beautiful, beautiful, complex, complex biblical Hebrew poetry that fits exactly to the song that their neighbors sing in the mosque or the neighbors sing in the market. But the words were always religious. It was always high, high religious poetry. And it became prayers. People start singing it in synagogues for so many years that they forgot that it originally was a, either a Muslim prayer or a folkloric song from the market. And it became part of the Jewish community heritage. And it was kept like that because it was sacred. Because of the words, because of the poetry, it was sacred. Nobody would change a word because it was a sacred prayer. Meanwhile, some of those songs in the Muslim communities in Morocco and Syria and Egypt and all those other countries, some of those songs got lost. Not every song lives for thousands of years. Some songs survive and some songs disappear after a few hundred years. And that created a very interesting situation in Morocco, for example, when there's two Muslim Moroccan musicians trying to figure out an old Moroccan song that they heard from their grandfather, and nobody really knows the song anymore. And some people play it this way, and other people play it that way, 
And the musicians argue, does it go like this or does it go like that? When they can't decide what they do, the Muslim musicians, they go to the rabbi. Ask the rabbi. The rabbi knows, the rabbi will sing to them the Jewish version that they've been praying in synagogue all those years. And they know the rabbi got it right because the Jews would not change a note because it's sacred. It's a sacred prayer because of the Hebrew. There's a whole culture, a whole philosophy developed about this team, a philosophy that the rabbis and the cantors, you know, some people said, this is not kosher. This is not allowed in a synagogue. It's a Muslim prayer. It's a, it's a, and many rabbis had to look into it, and they made a decision. This is a halakha. This is a Jewish law, a, a, a decision that is considered part of Jewish law in those, country, in those communities, that these songs considered 100% kosher. 100%. Because they, the rabbis considered that once you put Hebrew words to it and you sing it with your kavanah, you purify the melody. You rescue the melody. You lift the melody to a higher realm. There's other philosophies about that where they consider that the shepherds, the Bedouins, the Arabs have borrowed these melodies from the ancient Hebrew tribes. And they've been borrowing it all those years. They were guardians of it. They're just guarding that. And now the Jews are picking it up from them. And, and the Arabs, the Muslims, the Bedouins, the native people of the Middle East are helping the Jews to connect to their heritage. In any case, there's great reverence to the Muslim and the Arab, and Christian Arab, Christian Muslims. doesn't matter who they are. All the people who are not Jewish who sing this music and kept this music, there's great reverence and respect and love to them and to their mastery of the music among the Sephardic Mizrahi Jews. Now, all this is part of the Mizrahi tradition, and it didn't touch, didn't have any impact on Israeli music because it was only done in the synagogue with no in musical instrument. Just in the synagogue, singing, chanting. But in the last 20 years, it's been an incredible revolution in Israel with the Piyut. There's a, a couple of websites called Piyut.org. There's now Pastivala Piyut, the festival of the Piyut. There's the Piyut Ensemble representing Israel right now in WOMED in Australia in the World Festival of World Music. The Piyut Ensemble that specializes in those songs. It's in the radio. All the rock stars, people like Eti Ankri, Rami Fortis, punk, Israeli musicians, punk, rock musicians are doing Piyut music. They're doing their own versions of those Jewish prayers that were kept by the Mizrahi Jews. There's incredible renaissance, and the young generation love those poems, and they are st being studied and being archived, and this is a whole new movement that is shaping uh, Israeli music. So we'll play for you one of those songs that comes from Babylonian Iraqi Jewish tradition, and this was... This was originally was a song for Hoshana Rabba on the last day of Sukkot, where the tribes would come up to Jerusalem and circle around and celebrate the last day of Sukkot. So that's why the words are Hoshana, 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 Anna. And the rest of the song is a praise song for God. And if you'd like, um, on February 25th, we're going to play this in a big international festival in Sisan University in Northridge at the Valley Performance Art Center. They have a whole festival of uh, seven ensembles from around the world representing all the continents, six continents and one extra ensemble from Africa. Uh, and it's all about water, music and culture that comes from water, and they ask us to represent the Middle East. We are representing the Middle East, and we're going to do the music that came out of Simchat Bet Shoeva, the celebration of water in the, temp in the temple on the last day of Sukkot. There was a big, big celebration of water. And so we will do that for that festival on February 25th. Yeah. 
One of the uh, new trends in Israeli music is merging styles with other cultures. You may have heard about the Ethiopian Jews. About 20 years ago, the Ethiopian Jews came to Israel and changed the demographics of Israel. When I grew up in Israel, there was no black skin Israeli. Never. never met, I never met an African Jew. I, I would probably would faint if I would meet an African person starts speaking in Hebrew to me. But now there is. The Ethiopian Jews are part of the fabric of Israel. They serve in the army, they speak Hebrew, and they are from Ethiopia. And they bring their own, not just culture, but all, they have their own language. They know Hebrew, and they also have their own Ethiopian <laughs> tribe. One of the biggest superstars in Israeli music in the last 15 years is a man named Idan Reichel. You may have seen him. He's a great performer. He has a, a big band, and he started his career. His big success was taking Ethiopian Jews, Ethiopian Israelis, and putting them in a band and recording music that became a huge hit. That was the first time ever that Ethiopian Jews were uh, rock and roll stars in Israel, the first time in the history. And they shared the stage with him. And in his first two, three albums, and he, all of his tours featured men and women who are Ethiopians, and they sing in Hebrew and in Ethiopian. And Israelis loved it. He became a superstar, a huge superstar. And then he went to the world. He played in all the stages in the world. He plays with the best musicians in the world. He's been invited to perform every major international festival in the world. And while performing in those festivals, he met other great musicians from Africa, from China, from Morocco, from all over the world who come to those 
festivals, the best singer from Ofado, from Portugal, the best singer from Kenya, from Senegal, and he formed alliances and collaborations with those, and he started recording music with those. So they sing in Hebrew and Portuguese, Hebrew and African, and he teaches those other great stars Hebrew to sing the Hebrew part, and they write together the, the words. It's incredible success all over the world. He even collaborated with Alicia Keys in Central Park uh, a year ago, in Central Park in New York. He and Alicia Keys. This guy is Dan Reichel. And he is not afraid of collaborating with any, any culture. He, he brings the Hebrew and Israeli pop together with other cultures. So his style is, is Western. It's, it's like Shalom Chanoch. It's, it's Hebrew pop, Hebrew rock. It has its own special voice, but it's influenced by Western pop culture. So we're going to play for you this uh, music, and you will notice some of the words are in Hebrew, and some of the words are in, in Ethiopian. It's not gibberish, it's Ethiopian. Eleanor had to learn Ethiopian <laughs> to sing this song. <laughs> this song is called Mima Makim. Uh, it's a love song. Idan also writes the lyrics. He writes very poetic lyrics, mostly about relationships. Idan Reichel. His last name is spelled R-A-I-C-H-E-L. It would seem like Rachel, Rachel, but it's really pronounced Reichel. And uh, he performs a lot in Los Angeles. You may catch him. Nanonanone, <laughs> Nanonanonehe, <laughs> Nanonanonehe, <laughs> של ידייך באוזנייך לוחש מי זה קורא לך עליי להקשיבי מי שם בקול אלייך אל חלומך מי שם נפשו שתהיי מאושרת מי ישים יד ויבנה את ביתך מי ייתן חייו ישימה מתחתייך מי כבר לרגלייך יחיה מי יודך עוד מכל אהביך כל רוח ראה יצילך ממעמקים. ננו ננו נהה, ננו ננו נהה, כאן שלי גודאי. ננו ננו נהה, ננו ננו נהה, כאן שלי גודאי. ננו ננו נהה, 
Thank you. On bass, Justin Stein. Give him a hand. I'd like to uh, thank again to uh, Rabbi Feinstein to invite us to do this presentation. And I'd like to finish with a song that you probably all know that became a classic. This is a song that was written by a band called Sheva, which also created a revolution in Israeli music. Uh, they are one of the bands that included Arab musicians in their band. So th there were seven guys, one of them was Arab, um, and they mixed some Arabic words in their songs. And one of the songs is a song for peace. And so I'd like to finish with this song, with, as we all hope that peace will come one day. Inshallah, good willing. This is called Odia Shalom Aleinu. You probably know that. And in the course, the word Salam in Arabic, Salam, which is a call to the neighbors. That's why the word Salam is there. Salam, 
Politicians draw lines and build boundaries and set borders, whether they're green lines or red lines, and they grab territory, and artists erase lines. And they bridge boundaries, and they overcome borders, and they figure out how to create harmonies out of very disparate melodies, Western and Eastern, Mizrahi and Ashkenazic, Hasidic and modern rock and punk, Arabic and Jewish, artists have figured out a way to make shalom. And now, if only the politicians would sing with them. <laughs> Thank you so much. Before we leave tonight, before we leave tonight, we want to meet the musicians. So would you introduce them, Dan? Yeah. yeah. So the son of Cantor Mike Stein is Justin Stein on bass. <laughs> David Martinelli on percussion. <laughs> Jamie Papish on percussion. <laughs> Virginie Alumian on kanun. Norik Manukian on the woodwinds. And Elinor Citrish from Israel on vocals. Wow. I wanted just to mention, if you'd like to study more with me about interesting, fascinating things, I have a flyer about a whole weekend in March that I'm teaching in Los Angeles. And as you know, I'm not in Los Angeles a lot. I travel all over the world teaching. But this a whole weekend retreat is in Los Angeles. You don't have to go anywhere, and you can come whenever you want. You don't have to do the whole day. There are sessions, and people can come and go whenever they want. Uh, it's two days full of sessions of explorations and studying. I'm going to leave this um, flyer on our CD table. And not only CDs and digital download cards and 
books and DVDs that we have here, music for healing, music for meditation, music for peace, music for any, anything. We also have T-shirts. We have the Yuval Ron Ensemble T-shirts with koans of peace. Like, peace, I try to translate shalom to English. That the fact that shalom comes from the word shalem. How you translate it? I came up with peace, I, I, I came up with peace springs out of wholeness. Yeah. So peace springs out of wholeness. So that's one of our t-shirts. There's one, teach your children peace. There's one, inspired sound. Uh, mend the world with inspired sound. That's another one of our t-shirts. So come and talk to us. Take a flyer. And I hope to see you again soon. Um, I'll come to Rimonim next time with my daughter. That's, that's what I'll do. Okay, I hope to see you in Rimonim. Get one of the CDs, and if you put it on in your car, you become a much better driver. Because everybody on the road becomes your friend. Just don't close your eyes and start singing, It's really dangerous on the freeway. Have a very good night. Shalom. Thank you.